Well, it's, uh, we're, we're kind of celebrating Easter in October. I guess Easter Sunday will actually really be next Sunday. So I guess you call this Palm Sunday or Good Friday in October. It's kind of nice that we're looking at it at a different time of year. It's a passage we, uh, a topic in Scripture that we look at every year. Uh, so most people are familiar with the cross, what happens on that day. Um, but we always look at it, look at it in the spring, and always kind of in a typical same fashion. And so, looking at it in the middle of October, we get to uh, look at it with fresh eyes. Um, and if you remember, we've been looking at discipleship in Mark, this, this manual for discipleship, and we were challenged with this idea that uh, discipleship, while well, Jesus gave this challenge to his disciples in, in chapter 8, for them to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. I'm going to have to Kleenex or something, wipe these up. And uh, so to deny themselves and take up their cross. And last week, we really looked and focused on the idea of denial, of self-denial. Thanks a minute. You got one for me. I'm all foggy now. Um, denial last week. And this week we're looking at Jesus taking up his cross. And this idea of Jesus taking up his cross has, uh, it's familiar for some people, but it's also really offensive to other people. Uh, the new atheist today would, would call it divine child abuse. And uh, people many, many centuries ago also had a problem with it. People who might have even considered themselves followers of Christ. Just after Jesus was on the scene, uh, about a century, within the next couple centuries, the Gnostics arose and they had a real problem with the cross. They had a real problem with the idea of someone, true deity, suffering. Um, and uh, just a couple of notes on that. They, they thought it would actually compromise his true deity. And so, in their thinking, they attempted to spare Jesus the suffering of Golgotha. They attempted to explain it away. And so that's where we get some of these ideas that, that Jesus um, was somehow miraculously um, taken up into heaven like Elijah before he actually died on the cross. Uh, these strange ideas that it was actually Judas who suffered on the cross and not Jesus. Or, or that it was Simon of Cyrene, the man who carried his cross, was actually the guy who suffered on the cross and not Jesus. Uh, this, you, you see this showing up later on in Islam. They believe that he didn't suffer and die on the cross, that he was taken up. So we've got to spare this prophet, brothers, this son of God. We need, to dis, we need to spare him the suffering and the shame of the cross. Um, I, I want to read this quote to you that, um, from one of the commentaries that the suffering Son of God was seen by the Jews as a contradiction in terms, by the Greeks as foolishness, we, saw that in first, we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and by the dispassionate Stoics as an embarrassment. We need to spare Jesus the shame and suffering of the cross. Well, we're confronted with it in today's passage. Um, and we're going to see the purpose of it. We're going to see... Uh, what it accomplished. And so let's uh, turn to, to Mark chapter 15, and we're going to read Mark 15, 1 to 39. Mark 15, 1 to 39. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer. So, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison one who had committed murder in the insurrection. It was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. 
But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloth and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, (coughs) casting casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, king, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads at him and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also... The chief priests and the scribes mocked him, to one, mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Aloy, Aloy, Lemai Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Today we're going to, we're going to kind of take two passes at this text. One, kind of more on the exegetical level where we look at the details and we, we kind of examine what's going on here on the surface. But then we need to look uh, maybe a layer deeper and understand more fully what is really going on here. So throughout the book of Mark we have seen that it takes faith to have eyes to see and believe he really wants us to see what's going on here. Well, on the surface, just to summarize, in verses 1 to 5 we see his trial and then in 6 to 14, his condemnation. From 15 to 32, the scourge, the cross, and the scorn that he received. And then from 33 to 39, his abandonment and death. And that's how we'll, we'll go through it. So the first part, his trial. Well, it's morning, and as it's early in the morning, as Jim pointed out last week, that that's when Roman trials took place, because, of course, Roman... Uh, dignitaries were men of leisure and they needed to get out on the golf course and work on their tan so trials happened at at 6 a.m. which is when this all begins and it's also important because Mark 13 35 introduces four markers of time which are completed in this passage that was the parable of the master going away and the servants 
uh, taking care of things while he's away. They don't know when he, the master is going to return. Well, there were four time markers, which has, they've all shown up in our passage. It says, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning. So all four have been mentioned or implied by now. The Passover meal was in the evening, and Jesus was in the garden around midnight. The uh, tri- uh, excuse me, the, the rooster uh, crows and, uh, and Peter's denial. And then now we're at his trial in the morning. We also see this idea of Jesus' silence and his surrender to the will of God continuing. We've already touched on that. We, we, we saw that that was foreshadowed or, or prophesied in Isaiah 53, 7. But he doesn't need to say much, though, because Pilate, Pontius Pilate, is going to say the rest. He's going to say it for him. You see, Pilate's question, you are the king of the Jews, was actually worded as a statement. I'm sure inflected as a question. But he actually says, you are the king of the Jews. And so he states the truth. And it's um, Jesus, he, he, all he has to say is, you have said so. And of course, it's like he's saying, hey man, you said it, not me. It's kind of the perfect response for someone who doesn't really want to put his head in the noose, but he also doesn't want to deny what this man has actually said, knowing that it's true. It's a perfect response. And so what we see here in verse 5 is, we see the supreme Roman governor of this whole region declaring declaring Jesus to be the king of the Jews. But we also see him at, at the end of this passage that he stands before him dumbfounded and amazed before Jesus. And then his condemnation from, 16, from verse 6 to 14. In this part of the passage, it seems like Pilate has decided it's better to just watch this guy, keep a close eye on this guy, than to actually have him killed and executed. But he knows the Jewish authorities want Jesus dead. Out of, he says he knows it's out of envy that they want him to die. And so he puts Jesus' fate into the hands of the crowd. Crowd. We've seen these guys throughout the book of Mark. The crowd has... They've been fickle and undecided. They're the ones who are on the fence, and they're, they're really quick to come to Jesus for his benefits, but they're still on the fence. They're undecided. Well, what can this political prisoner in chains offer them now? And we're not in Galilee anymore. We're in Jerusalem. It's not a friendly crowd. He's surrounded by people who maybe haven't seen as many of the miracles as he provided up in Galilee in his ministry there. And so, they they turn against him. And Pilate's plan, it backfires. And so Pilate thought, I I normally offer a pardon around this time at religious feasts, at Passover, so why not let them make the decision? So he offers a choice. Barabbas, a rebel and a murderer, someone who is deserving of death, or Jesus, the so-called king of the Jews. And we see a a little dig in, in that statement. One man will go free, and one man will hang on a cross. One man is truly guilty and deserving of death, and one man is innocent. And as I said, we know this plan backfires. Three times the crowd calls out, crucify him, crucify him. And they want Barabbas to go free. Third time they cry out, all the more, crucify him. And then in Mark 15, verse 15 to 32, the scourge, the cross, and the scorn. The all-powerful Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he has his hand forced by the crowd. And he condemns Jesus to be flogged with I'm sure you've heard a description of this before, the flagellum, the, the leather whip, uh, the, the strips of leather that had bone and bits of metal <clears throat> embedded in it so that it tore the flesh with each strike of the whip. So, yeah, we know it was brutal. We know it was bloody. It's shocking we've seen it portrayed in, in films. That seems to be where most people focus. 
their attention when they're portraying it. But Mark is very economic in, in his words and how he decides to describe it. He only uses three words in our English translation, but actually in the Greek it's only one word. Just to let us know that he's wit. And letting our imagination kind of do the rest. Next, he's handed over to a battalion of Roman soldiers, which was probably around 600 men. It's one-tenth of, um, I forgot, a larger unit. But how much fun do you think 600 Roman soldiers can have with the enemy of the state? With a political prisoner like Jesus. We got one word for the flogging, but we get five whole verses about how they treat him about how this time passed with these heroes of Rome. And do you think that maybe Mark is emphasizing something for his original audience, the, the, the people of Rome? You, you realize, you remember that Mark was written to primarily, or at least initially, a Roman audience. I think maybe he's communicating something <coughs> to, to his original audience. Now as we put ourselves in their shoes also to us. Well, <clears throat> this battalion of Roman soldiers, they, they orchestrate a mock coronation of Jesus, the King of the Jews. And in our entire passage, including Pontius Pilate and the chief priests, Jesus is called the King of the Jews six times. They bring him into the palace, they dress him like a king, they put a crown on him and they pay homage to him, they parade him, around as a king um, and they force Simon of Cyrene to serve him like a loyal subject and finally they enthrone him on a Roman cross and again with shockingly few words Mark tells us and they crucified him we get a lot more details in the other gospels Mark is very brief, very succinct and they crucified him and of course, this is all to mock and to shame him. He's already been a little bit mocked with that dig by Pilate, and now thoroughly he's been mocked by the soldiers. Now, in verse 27, we're told that he's been mocked by the he's being mocked by the two robbers who were crucified at his right and on his left. And then in verse 29, it's those who are passing by that are mocking him because he claimed to destroy the temple and to rebuild it in three days that he would. And this would have been blasphemy, but of course we, we know that Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his own body. Not actually committing blasphemy, but they're mocking him. And, and when Mark says in that verse that they derided him for this, the actual word there is that they blasphemed him. And so for Jesus to claim to destroy the temple, that he would be able to destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it three days later, that would be blasphemy. But by mocking Jesus, these passers-by, they were actually blaspheming him. They are guilty of the very thing that they are accusing him of. When you mock the Son of God, you're blaspheming. Well, the chief priests and the scribes, they also mock him. They are challenging him to prove his identity as the Christ, the King of Israel, by escaping death. Escape death and prove who you are. By the end of our passage today, we will see that it's actually his manner of death that proves his identity. Now, the end of verse 32 says, those crucified with him also reviled him. And this is the fifth mention of him being mocked and shamed and blasphemed and reviled. So what is Mark focusing our attention on? Three words for they crucified him. All these verses to show that he was mocked, shamed, blasphemed, and reviled. It's focusing our, on our attention on the utter shame of the cross even over and above his physical abuse mark 15:33 to 39 his abandonment and death 
After being mocked, we see Jesus speak again for the first time since verse 2. He's been utterly silent for our entire passage. He cried out. Mark quotes his original Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And then provides the translation, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is now abandoned by the Father because of our sin. And he cries out in the painful words of Psalm 22 that we read at the beginning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer and by night I find no rest. In fact, all of Psalm 22, many of the verses we read and others, they read like a script for this crucifixion. Psalm 69 is also a key psalm uh, that, that references many of the things that happened in Jesus' crucifixion. We see the mocking and the head wagging and the taunting for Jesus to save himself. <laughs> The bystanders demonstrate a spiritual deafness and a blindness to who Jesus is by not hearing him correctly and thinking that he's calling out for Elijah who would come down and rescue him, which is something the Jews at that time believed, that, that Elijah, who had ascended into heaven without dying, would come to the rescue for Jews who were in trouble. Well, finally, Jesus utters a loud cry, and he exhales for the last time. There are two supernatural events, two supernatural signs that accompany his death. Three hours of darkness from noon until about 3 p.m. And the temple veil being torn from top to bottom. This veil was, it was 20 cubits tall. It was, um, that's about 30 feet tall. And it's torn from top to bottom. There's one more verse to look at about this man who has eyes to see. But we need to come back to that in a moment. We'll save that for the end. So we've taken a look at what's happening uh, kind of on the surface in this passage. And so now we need, need to take a deeper look and consider what's really going on in this momentous event. Because Mark chose his details very sparingly and very intentionally to teach us, to disciple us, to challenge us. So what does he want us to see? Well, as he's been presenting throughout the whole book of Mark, he is presenting Jesus as the suffering servant. And if you recall the key passage from Mark 10.45, we said this was the theme verse of the whole book. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve to give his life as a ransom for many. And we see that essential to the concept of being a servant is self-denial, which here is ultimately achieved by his suffering and death as a substitute for others. As a substitute. And we also saw his charge that I already mentioned in 834, where he called those of us who would call ourselves disciples to accept the mission that he had for himself. And he said, in calling the crowd to him, he said, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Self denial and accepting suffering, even suffering on a Roman cross. So essential to the concept of suffering is that when it's a choice, it challenges our willingness to deny ourselves. Suffering directly challenges our willingness to deny ourselves. The alternative is that we seek to save ourselves, to preserve ourselves, just as Peter did last week in his denial. We reject the role as a servant for others, and we look after our three best friends, me, myself, and I. Well, so beyond just recording the historical event of the crucifixion, 
what does this passage add to our understanding of Jesus as the suffering servant? And so I'm going to outline three primary things that Mark wants to teach us here about what it means for Jesus to be the suffering servant. First, how he truly served us. Secondly, what he truly suffered. And thirdly, what he truly accomplished through his suffering and service. How he truly served us, what he truly suffered, and what he truly accomplished through his suffering and service. So first of all, how he truly served us. And the key word here is substitution. Substitution. He stood in our place and took what we deserved for our own sin. From Isaiah 53 again, verses 5 and 6, it says it well. He was pierced for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We saw Jesus take the place of a murderer, a rebel. Barabbas, and his name is significant. His name, Bar-Abbas. Remember what Jesus called the Father in his prayer in the garden? Abba, Father. Bar-Abbas, Son of the Father. He takes the place of Barabbas, the Son of the Father. The one and only true Son of the Father takes the place of another as his substitute. And in fact, there's from Matthew 27, there's <coughs> manuscript evidence that's probably been suppressed by scribes who were uncomfortable with it because it's too close to home, too close for comfort. There's manuscript evidence that his name was in fact, and you'll see it in your English translations, Jesus Barabbas. Yeshua Barabbas. One Jesus as a substitute or another. There is sin all over this passage. Barabbas, the murderer, envy of the chief priest, the thieves crucified next to him, and in the middle of them all is one innocent man that becomes a substitute for all of them and all of us. We too have gone astray. We have turned, we, every one of us, to our own way. We're learning here that we are Barabbas. And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. And this is how he serves us. He becomes our substitute. So now what he truly suffered. And your key word here is separation. His physical suffering is there. Mark doesn't hide it. It's very brief in his description, but he doesn't hide it. And he focuses on a greater suffering. But we, we also saw his shame. That was there too. He bore the shame of the cross. He bore the, all of the shame. It was emphasized more than the physical suffering. Because in the West, um, we wear our shame with pride. Uh, we, we have our fails. And we post them on YouTube, and we hope we get lots of clicks. Um, I love fail videos, I'm sorry. It's a guilty pleasure. But we laugh at shame in the West. In the East, the original culture of Jesus and everyone around him, it was no laughing matter. Shame was an excellent way of describing the relational conflict and discord that was created between us and God because of our sin. From Adam and Eve, naked and ashamed in the garden, all the way to Jesus on the cross, the consequence of sin has been shame. A concept that we're disadvantaged in the West to understand. But I'll suggest that there's also a deeper and a greater suffering. More than the physical pain, more than the shame. We would do well to see separation from our Creator and Heavenly Father 
as the greatest suffering imaginable, one worthy of being called hell. Now, he has already suffered abandonment by his disciples. We actually see that pointed to in this passage. Simon of Cyrene was there, ready to take up a cross. Where was Simon Peter? And Jesus had two thieves at his right and his left, where James and John had requested to be when Jesus came into his kingdom. So where were James and John? Abandoned by those closest to him. And now we see him abandoned in judgment, by his eternal Father. The comparison of Jesus' baptism in chapter 1 with his crucifixion here really brings this out. At his baptism, the, heaven, the heavens were torn open. At his death, the temple veil is torn in two. It's the only time the, the verb schizo, from which we get schizophrenia, is used in the book of Mark, and it's used of the tearing or the rending of the heavens in chapter 1 and the tearing of the veil which in fact one of the veils in the temple actually had a, a mural, basically a mural of the heavens woven into it tearing of the heavens in the beginning and a tearing of the heavens at the end from heaven the spirit had descended upon him at his baptism and in death he gave up his spirit God's voice thundered down at his baptism. Now there's three hours of darkness and silence. <clears throat> at his baptism, God announced his approval of his son. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And in his death, Jesus is forsaken by the Father. Jesus took our sin and our iniquity, and with it, he took separation from the Father that he had never known from eternity past. He is the eternal Son of God, always knowing the Father in this relationship. And for the first time in eternity, he is suffering the separation from his eternal Father. This is what he truly suffered on our behalf because of sin. But we need to see also what he truly accomplished. It is a victory that brings salvation. What looks like weakness and failure to the naked eye, in fact, is strength and victory. The Roman soldiers, they mocked Jesus as a false king, as a pretender. And in fact, they were unknowingly somewhat, they were participating in a standard Roman coronation, even beyond their actions at the palace. A Roman military victor, he would, be, he would begin his triumphal procession, which is why it's appropriate that this is like Palm Sunday, it's a new triumphal procession. He would begin his triumphal procession at the Praetorium, where all the soldiers were. And he would be clothed in purple. He would be given a victor's crown, as Jesus was given the crown of thorns. And he would be celebrated by his men, as they paid homage to him. And then he would be led out in a procession to the Capitoline Hill in Rome. The Capitoline Hill, which translated means the place of the head. The place of the head. The final destination on this hill was actually the Temple of Jupiter in Rome. Jupiter was considered the king of the gods. And he was enthroned there in his temple with his two companions, Juno and Minerva. So we see the parallels in today's passage, from being clothed with purple crown to being sacrificed between two thieves on Golgotha, the place of the skull. Now this is all very interesting to see these correlations with how a triumphal procession would happen in Rome. But what do you think this communicates to Mark's readers in Rome? To his original audience, to the Roman Christians, who were being persecuted and were suffering 
by the hands of this reigning authority. It's subtle, kind of hidden from Roman eyes, but something very subversive, something very revolutionary. And God orchestrated these events in the context of the Roman Empire to communicate His supremacy. This is the anti-triumph of the king of the Jews over Rome and their king of the gods. It takes faith to see this as a true coronation and as a true victory. To see Jesus as the true Son of God. And so finally we come to verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Who is it that looks upon Jesus enthroned upon a cross on this hill between his two companions, breathing his last breath and says to himself, truly, this man was the Son of God. The Roman centurion. Nothing about this scene has the outward appearance of victory. But this Roman centurion had eyes to see that in Jesus' darkest hour, he was most revealing his true identity. And we only need to turn back to the beginning of the book of Mark. <clears throat> the very first verse which told us what this book is all about. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Christ, which Peter confessed in chapter 8, in the middle of your book, the Son of God, which now we hear on the lips of a Roman centurion. This presentation of who Jesus is is now complete, and it would not be complete without his death. But we need to have faith to see it. And finally, his victory was more than just a victory over the Roman pantheon. It was a victory that brought salvation for you and I. A victory over sin and its consequences. When the temple veil was torn down the middle, the barrier that separated a holy God from sinful man was torn in two and was no more. That barrier was removed through Jesus, through his death. Jesus' death brings peace and reconciliation between God and man. Again in Isaiah 53, 5, it said, The chastisement that fell upon Jesus, fell upon him, brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. His death brings peace with God and healing from the greatest sickness for any who are willing to trust in Jesus as their substitute. If you don't want the Son of God to stand in as your substitute, then you don't have peace with God. And he said that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. A ransom is paid to liberate someone from their bondage. And if you don't want him to pay your ransom with his blood, then you remain in bondage to your sin. However, if you would be freed from the penalty of your sin... And if you would be reconciled to God, then I would invite you to place your faith in Jesus today and to allow Him to be your substitute. That you might share in His victory and receive forgiveness for sin. And for those of us who know Christ and have placed our faith in Him, it is a reminder that that separation was experienced and received by Jesus, so that we don't have to walk and experience that separation anymore. He has provided forgiveness, and reconciliation, and peace. And so we celebrate that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you just for a new opportunity, a new day, to look at the cross, to be amazed at who you are, 
to be amazed at this plan and how it is and orchestrated both to demonstrate your supremacy over the false gods of the day, but also demonstrate your victory in an eternal sense over sin and death. Thank you for the hope that it gives us. Thank you for the reconciliation that we have with you through Jesus. Give us eyes to see that even when we're struggling with the sin that we may commit today. Just to receive that forgiveness afresh. We know we have it. Help us to walk in it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.